Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Life in the Law, Wednesdays from 1 to 1.30. I'm delighted today to have Carlos Perez Mesa on my show. He's a colleague of mine and also a very well-known litigator about town. And you can tell me all about litigation because I don't know anything about litigation. So welcome, Carlos. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a, a guest on your show. I don't know how well-known I am, but um, I have had some trial experience. So. Yeah. How long have you been here? Uh, 26 years. I think I, you're um, known then. Well, to the lesser or greater degree, but I um, met my wife in New York City. Um, she's from Hawaii. She convinced me to move from New York City to Hawaii. Um, at that time, I was working for a firm in Newark, New Jersey with an office overlooking the Passaic River. So I traded that office for an office looking overlooking the Pacific Ocean. So you I have think a beautiful it, office. Too. Yeah, no, it, it's, yeah. it's been a good transition. Um, and I've been in Hawaii 26 years, so I think I'm officially Kamaaina. Is she from Kailua, your wife? Uh, yeah, Kailua. She went to St. Andrews Priory, where she tells me she was a valedictorian. And I you should watch our it. show on St. Andrews coming up on OC16 within there you the go. next month. Insta plug. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, our, some of our young interns are doing the show. It should be fascinating. And just like my husband, you're, you're just like me. My husband's from Kailua, and we met in New York. And, and why wouldn't you come here? You know what I yeah, mean? No, it's it was, kind of like a no-brainer. Yeah, it was, it was a very easy call. Uh, I was working for a firm in Newark. wasn't particularly happy there. I had a car in a guarded lot over Christmas. It was stolen. Um, I don't know how a car can get stolen out of a guarded lot. But at that point in time, I was getting kind of sick of the Newark area. Not to slam Newark, but... Um, you know, it's, well, Newark's rough. Though. Yeah, it's, it, it's, I'm from New York, and it's I'll not, say that. Yeah, it's not Honolulu. So, yeah. when my wife asked me if I wanted to move to Hawaii, I said, uh, "Sure." So, I we flew from New York to Maui, where our parents owned a bookstore, and she ran the bookstore, and I studied for the bar. I got the oh, best tan of my life. Uh, that's a was, terrific way to go. It was it was easy going from Newark to to the uh, a nice condo uh, in Maui. Right. So, do they still have the bookstore there? No, it was a. It was, it was right before borders came in, and uh, it just was not a particularly good location. And no offense to Maui, but not, not a not a big reading population. Not a big there. reading population, <laughs> but they had a nice uh, they had a nice candy store. They had a nice place you could get some coffee and people could hang out. But it was it was doomed to fail, unfortunately. But uh, my wife did a good job running it. Uh, like I say, I studied for the bar, and uh, uh, from there moved to Honolulu. Oh, okay. That's isn't it, it's such a drag. We have to retake the bar when we, we every single person well, has to retake the bar to but, come but, here. But we having been an attorney here for twenty six years, it's a good idea that you have to take the the bar. Otherwise, there'd be you know every Tom, Dick, and Harry would be coming to Hawaii Gobs to practice law. Yeah, and and that's not the sort of uh, environment you really want to want to have. So uh, even if you're Supreme Court justice, I think you still have to uh, take the bar here. But yeah, I took took the bar and. Uh, Started on my merry way and uh, uh, being a lawyer here in Hawaii. So you you do insurance defense. Correct. Okay. So largely. What what does that mean? You can because I have no idea. Okay, uh, I explain it as like this. So for example, let's say you have State Farm insurance. You're in a car accident. Let's say you rear end somebody. You have State Farm insurance. The person you rear end decides to sue you. Then as uh, I would represent the State Farm insured in the lawsuit that's been filed against them. So oh. it's, a, it's a defensive action. So my job, large, to a large extent, is to uh, try to determine uh, the credibility of the plaintiff, the nature and extent of their injuries, um, and try to minimize the recovery. Wow. Um, I'm surprised they use outside counsel for that. They, they, don't they have their own cadre of lawyers? I, I used to do that. I was an AIG in-house counsel oh. for a number of okay. years, for seven years, did only AIG cases. Um, uh, after that, I went on on my own with another gentleman by the name of Roy Epstein. So it was Epstein and Perez Mesa serving the greater Jewish and Cuban communities here in Honolulu. <laughs> um, and I did a lot of AIG work uh, as well as uh, work for other firms. But uh, people don't understand this, but 99.3% of cases in Hawaii, civil cases, settle. Yes, they so, do. So uh, it's, it's actually very rare that a case goes to trial. However, uh, I've been 
fortunate or unfortunate enough to have tried about 20 cases here in Hawaii on, on all the islands, some big, some small. Do you love trial? Do you shine I, 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 I do. I like the theatrics of it all. I'm a movie geek, and one of the reasons I went into law was like most people who go into law, I saw To Kill a Mockingbird. I liked it. Me too. I Me like, too. I like, exactly. How I could like you good, not be? Yeah, I like good oratory, um, and uh, which includes when I was uh, practicing Catholic, there were some priests who could deliver terrific homilies, and I thought well, a, I like the gift of oratory to be able to reach people. Absolutely. Um, and like I say, I like film, so all that encouraged me to uh, go into law, in particular litigation. And it is it is a rush, but it's it's a lot of work, and you don't want to be doing it too often because it's very wearing. Right, it's very um, yes. time-consuming. The preparation is very time-consuming. Absolutely, and also there's the element of unpredictability. Any attorney who tells their client they can guarantee a certain result if somebody who's never tried a case. Right. Because you, you never know what the 12 people are going to do, what issues are, they're going to focus on, any of those things. So Would you say the closer cases come to trial anyway? Like, in other words, if the case was clearer one way or another, it would settle probably before trial, right? Or yes, so yes. So you're, you're really talking about the ones that uh, can can argue either side with a... Co correct. Generally, the cases, that, at least that I've been involved in that go to trial, are cases that involve big issues of liability, that is, big issues of who's at fault, or big issues of damages. So, for example, uh, as a defense attorney, you would typically try to minimize the plaintiff's injuries. Sure. The plaintiff attorneys would try to maximize them. So what may be a, a small neck strain, the defense would argue, the plaintiff's attorney would argue, no, no, that's a serious condition. It's going to require surgery. Right. And then there are issues of causation and science and medicine that the, the, the way in, in in terms of evaluating a person's injuries. Are the personal in New York, the personal injury um, lawyers are um, they're sort of a, a group unto themselves. They're real kind of flamboyant guys, really <laughs> law, big personality guys. Is that true here too? Do that? Do you have that kind uh, of big personality? Some personal attorney, personal injury attorneys are good friends of mine. Right. But uh, that doesn't mean they can't have a big personality. That, 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 I have a big personality. That, that, that is that is true. Um, there are some that fit in that category. Um, not all, though. I think, again, most plaintiff attorneys would rather avoid court mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it doesn't make a lot of business sense to do that. Mm -hmm, and again, there's mm -hmm. the issue of unpredictability. But yeah, there are a lot of uh, flamboyant personalities that, that become personal injury attorneys. I mean, the, 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 the Marvin Belleyes. Uh, right, that, that's that, what I had in mind. Yeah. yeah, those, yeah. those kinds of people that... I won't mention names on the air, but there, there are certain attorneys here that kind of fit that profile. That, I think that's a great, a great way to be. If, if you can be a small, sole practitioner or have a small practice and be yourself and, yeah. you know, make lots of money too, what's not to like? It's a great, it's a great form sure. of practice. Sure, and uh, uh, trials, as much as attorneys try to deny it, is a form of theater. It's a form of performance. Absolutely. Uh, and you have to understand that. And with all these TV shows, uh, certain... If you're a juror, you want to you want to want to show you want. You, if you see Law and Order 20, 30, 40 times, you expect the closing argument's going to look like this. Right. The opening's going to look like this. Right. A cross examination's going to look like this. They're looking for the the Perry Mason moment, which usually are few and far between. Right. Right. I mean, there's not going to be a situation where you're going to get a doctor on the stand and they're going to say, oh, that's right, I'm not really right. a doctor. I'm, right. you know, I'm actually a podiatrist from Newark. <laughs> no, the, you don't get those moments. But you're, you're constantly trying to chip away their credibility, the documents they relied upon, right. all the basis for their conclusions. So it's, if it's, I think it's really interesting um, how much... TV and movies have an influence on lawyers. Absolutely. You said that people see uh, a closing argument, they expect that closing That's argument. That's true. I, I think people don't realize that, that um, uh, it, shapes, it shapes people's views of the courtroom. I mean, all, like all these Tom Cruise movies in which he's a lawyer and, you know. Right, right. I mean, those are obviously your, your it's for entertainment, so you want to maximize the drama and the, the, the timing of certain things, and you want that big production, which, uh, Rarely, rarely yeah. comes to pass in an actual trial. I mean, a lot of the times, quite frankly, can be a little tedious. Uh, I had a case recently where we had to educate a judge on uh, sewage pipes. And quite frankly, it's kind of hard to make the sewage pipe... Uh, sexy. It's, 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 <laughs> it's worth it. You can't make it sexy. You, you just can't. Um, but you do what you can and to maximize your ability to communicate and, and, may, and reach out to the jury and try to highlight those issues that they're going to, they're going to focus on. Uh, I liken it a lot to, um, now that the 
RNC just finished and the DNC is going on to, to writing uh, speeches. And, reach, and you got to know which audience you're trying to reach, what points they're going to accept, right. uh, what, what arguments not to make. Uh, and that's, and that maybe that's why a lot of lawyers go into politics. But uh, all those things come into play. Right. And you want to have a certain script um, and try to stay within that script. Did you ever want to be an actor? Or did you always want to be a lawyer? Um, no, maybe I'm a frustrated actor. I don't know, but uh, I, I do like the, I like I do like the performance aspect of being a trial attorney. I would not want to be uh, stuck at a desk doing research research twenty four seven. That's just not me. I think you'd be a very memorable actor because I think well, you're distinctive in in the off. I think you'd be very memorable. Well, that's, yeah, I really that's, do. That's that's kind. Yeah, um, I, I, I can see it. My um my father was a physician from Cuba. My uncle was a physician from Cuba. And uh, very theatrical, uh, a lot of hand gestures. So they they were the type of doctors that people would tend to remember because they had kind of big personalities and uh, they didn't take take themselves that seriously. So they emigrated from Cuba before the revolution. Correct. Um, the the revolution was basically 1959. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a physician. My uncle was a physician, uh, and they left Cuba in the mid 50s. Uh, for a couple of reasons, but primarily because they had fallen afoul of the Batista regime, and anyone who knows anything about Latin American politics or Cuban politics in general knows that the Batista regime was basically a puppet regime of the United States government, mm -hmm. um, and it was a very repressive regime, uh, much like the Shah of Iran before he got toppled. Right, sure. but, but, but long story short, they realized that their cr professional career would be very limited if uh, Bautista remained in place and there were safety issues. So they both left as physicians to the United States, not speaking a word of English. I so, God, I love a story like that. I mean, you can't help but love that. It, 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 no, it's, it's very, very impressive it to impressive. be a f physician, not speak the language, have to learn the language and take the international board to become a licensed physician right. uh, in, in the United States. But they, they did that. Um, my uncle uh, was very close to, to Cuba still, and he would go back two or three times a year to, uh, once, once he was able to, uh, to donate medical books from the United States to Cuba. So there wasn't the kind of tension. I mean, some, some Cuban communities, I'm thinking of Cuban communities in Florida, there's a little bit of tension with, with the current administration. And, right. But y your uncle didn't, wasn't so well, dead I, set against that, or was he? Well, there are, there are factions within the Cuban-American population. Uh, for example, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and most of the fo Florida Floridian Cubans are very conservative. Right. Uh, my father and my uncle were the exact opposite. Right. They're, they were certainly, to repeat, certainly not pro-Castro, but they certainly saw the benefits of the revolution coming in. Right, because if they didn't, if, if Batista was an issue, I mean, that was a solution, right? It might not have been the right solution, Correct. it was a solution. Correct. And so the health education uh, of the average Cuban citizen actually has improved right. as well as a literacy rate under the Castro right. regime. However, obviously I'm not going to take a, a pro-Castro position in light of the long-standing history of, of abuse and civil rights. No, no, that, that, absolutely that, that, But it's an interesting that there's such a diversity among the Cuban-American population, yeah. and it's viewed so differently. I guess maybe it's not so surprising if, if one just thought about it for a moment. Well, a, a lot, lot of the times it depends on what class you were leaving when you came to Cuba. My, my well, let me just take sure. a quick break, and I would love to talk about the class structure of Cuba. That's like... I'm totally interested in that. So you're watching Life of the Law. I'm Marian Sasaki with Carlos Perez Mesa, and we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. Hey, everybody. My name is David Chang, and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me live every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Thank you. 
Hi, welcome back to Life in the Law. Carlos and I were just embarking on a conversation about the class structure of the emigres from Cuba. And as I said, that's, I find that very interesting. And so tell me how the class structure influenced the uh, political uh, beliefs of the emigres that, that landed here. Well, I, I think if, if you are a middle or upper middle class, you leave Cuba, you left a lot behind. You lost mm -hmm. property to the government, so obviously you're going to be bitter towards the Castro regime. However, at least in my, my father and uncle's situation, they, they were not landowners. Uh, the story was that uh, their parents won a lottery which allowed them to pay for my uncle and my father to go to medical school. So when they left Cuba, they weren't leaving behind a palatial mansion. Right. They, they were leaving uh, not much in ways of material positions. Right. Um, but, but my father was, quite frankly, very, very intelligent. Um, so he picked up English very quickly. Uh, he met my mother at Colorado Springs. My mother was a lab laboratory technician, and uh, I guess my mother liked the Ricky Ricardo accent, which was the Lu love. I love Lucy show was, was big. Who wouldn't love so, a Latin um, American accent? Everybody does. Yeah. So uh, they met. My father had to go back to Cuba. He had a hard time getting back, leaving Cuba, back to the United States. But uh, they met. Uh, he did his residency in St. Louis, and. Uh, uh, the years go by, I'm born, my brother's born, Melissa's born. Okay. And we were the, basically for a long time, the only Hispanic population in Columbia, Missouri, which is where I I, I can I imagine up. that that's yeah. true. Yeah. But you know, it, y your explanation of, of uh, the class structure in Cuba it makes so much sense, particularly, you know, because Carlos and I have very similar political beliefs. And it, so it's unsurprising that Rubio and Cruz are Republicans and people like us are, are Democrats because that the uh, values, the Republican values, are those of the, of the rich. And so do you, want to have, do you have any comments about the Republican <laughs> convention or this one? Uh, the Republican uh, was crazy. It was ridiculous. Well, I, I just woke up this morning and read Huffington Post, and I'm reading that... Uh, Donald Trump is actually encouraging Russia to, to hack Hillary's emails, right. which, is, which is astounding. So and, presidential. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it's absolutely astounding in this day and age. Um, but going back to the Republican National Convention, um, I've, I'm a lifelong liberal Democrat, but I've never in a million years would disparage the opponent. I would never say throw Romney in jail, throw McCain in jail, and any disparaging comments towards the, their political opponent. But we, we reached a new low point, yeah. and it's very, it's very disturbing. And He's I don't certainly know, not a gentleman statesman. No, no, not at all, and this is following on the heels of one of the most dignified, intelligent, restrained uh, individuals who's had to deal with obstructionism for the last eight years. Uh, and but for a very intransigent Republican uh, uh, Congress, could have gotten a lot agreed, more done. Agreed, but, I couldn't agree with you more. And. Um, you know, it's funny, did we talk about this, that we think that Hillary Clinton's choice for uh, vice president was colored by the fact that she didn't want to take senators who would be appointed by Republican governors away from, that, that she's looking to have a majority in the Senate so she can get some Supreme Court justices or something. Right, no, we, we did touch upon that briefly, and if I can just address that briefly. Um, Tim, Tim Kaine seems to be a, a perfectly fine choice. I think that's right. Uh, uh, of good character, intelligence, intelligence speaks speak Spanish, he can yeah. reach out to Spanish-American uh, voters. He's like um, us, the liberal Democrat Catholic, he's a practicing Catholic, it, exactly. a former Catholic. And, and, and a thoroughly decent, nice person who, who has every right to be the vice presidential candidate. I'm quite frankly, as, as a Bernie supporter, uh, I am more than a bit disturbed of all the Bernie or bus people. I think. I think they're. And, and to quote Sarah Silverman, they're just being ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and and uh, nothing else. Sore losers. They're but being histrionic, and and I don't know. It's the, the the stakes are too high in this election, and I will go out and let me say that the 2016 elect 2016 election is the most important of, of my generation, just in terms I think of that's the, right. uh, uh, just in terms of the way the country can can go. Right. Um, but uh, be that as it may, yes, I have a, a, a long abiding interest in, in politics, but I would never in a million years want to go into it simply because I don't think I have a tough enough skin and uh, would feel very frustrated by uh, dealing with people who don't respect facts. Oh, Not well, in Hawaii, but I'm just no, nationwide. Uh, well, you know, listen, in if you want to go into politics, Hawaii is one of the best places because they the, the 
the people are, uh, they're, they're honest, genuine, and they're, they're very left-leaning. So I was delighted to come here. Yeah, Carlos and I were the, were we the sole um, <laughs> lawyers who supported Bernie Sanders? It was like a little yeah. secret that we had in the office that we were like, we couldn't believe, I mean, we, as he kept going on and on, right. it was really an, an amazing, an amazing story. It was an amazing story that, that came out of nowhere in much the same way that the Trump campaign kind of came out of nowhere, right. and no one took, uh, took him seriously. But uh, he ran a, a terrific campaign. I think he's moved the party in the right direction. Um, and I think his supporters should uh, be very grateful for that. Right. Um, uh, and let me just use this opportunity to give a shout out to a friend of mine who's uh, a local politician, Trevor Ozawa, who serves on the city council. Oh, you know, we I used know to work him. at the firm. That's right. He used to work um, at Clay Chapman. Uh, very, very decent, nice, uh, intelligent. I'll have to get him on the show. Trevor, you have to yeah. come on the show. Yeah, he's we'll have to talk. You'll tell me all the, all the secrets of the firm. <laughs> so, um, I was going to say, oh, you know, I was thought when you said a shout out to a friend, I thought you were going to say Cory Booker because he's from your neck of the woods. And he, he was spectacular, I he, thought. He gave a very, very good speech and I thought it was uh, underappreciated. Well, um, Michelle Obama. I, exactly. And I felt sorry a little bit for Elizabeth Warren who had to follow up Michelle Obama who gave a, a, just a phenomenal speech. Um, and I thought Bill Clinton did a fine job as well. And I, I'm expecting fireworks tonight from the president. Um, oh, I think he's going to be great. Yeah. I, he, he's always great. I mean, he's, uh, he's one of those guys where everything falls into place for him. I mean, I've known about him for a very long time. And he left a legacy even when he was in law school. He was well known, you know, as, as the, exactly well, the kind of person he is now. Yeah, I, I remember uh, there was a New York Times article about him when he was the first African-American editor of the Harvard Law Review. So mm -hmm. he was on the screen, he, he was on the radar then, and then mm -hmm. giving the, uh, basically the keynote address, I believe it was in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember seeing that and I thought, wow, that's... That was an unbelievable. Uh, uh, just a terrific speech, and yeah. you, know, you know he wrote pretty much all of it. And you could see, you could see that he was, he was destined for, you know, great things. So what do you think is going to happen now with President Obama and Michelle Obama? Like, do you, th they're so young, and I mean... Uh, that, that is hard to say. I, I assume each of them will be writing books. Um, I just read today that the Presidential Library is going to be in Chicago, unfortunately not in Hawaii, but um, yeah, so be it. Um, but I, I would hope that Michelle would use the, the massive amount of goodwill she's developed as First Lady to give speeches, give lectures, uh, and, and do a lot of even more public, public service work. I'd love to work. see her do... Do I mean, I'd love to see him take the s sort of supporting role and see what she's capable of doing because I have a feeling it's like it's tremendous things. I don't know if she has any interest in that, but I mean sh she was so spectacular at the convention, and you know. But you know what? I my real dream is my real dream is for President Obama to be appointed to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I don't think I think that's a pipe dream. I don't think that can ever happen. But I think he'd be an it's excellent justice. No, he's very young. No, no, no question. I think the short answer is he can probably do pretty much anything he wants right. to. Um, I, I would hope, like his, his wife, that he would uh, do a lot of speaking engagements, and particularly, uh, particularly in urban areas, um, because I think he, he could be a beacon of hope for, for a lot of people. So he can go into areas like Baltimore sure. or Ferguson Absolutely. or uh, inner city uh, Los Angeles yes. and, and basically be a beacon of hope for yes. these folks and, again, highlight the important of, uh, importance of education and family and all those values that, uh, that, that are important. So let's talk about Hillary Clinton. I mean, it, you know, we were, we were Bernie supporters, so for a long time, um, you know, we, I, w I would say I despair. I you know, just didn't think very highly of Hillary Clinton. But I'm, but I'm fairly happy, I mean, I'm fairly happy she's the candidate, and I'm certainly happy that this momentous uh, woman, that a woman became a candidate, this, this happened finally for us. Yeah, I, I think she suffered from a lot of bad pressure. I mean, you have to understand, she's been in the public eye a long I know. time. There's a long record uh, I agree. Of, 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 uh, against her. I agree. Um, she's a little moderate for my taste, but, but, but so be it. She's so a little hawkish. The I, that's my biggest issue with her, is the hawkish. And even TPP, I don't really, not, not such a big issue. But I, I'm afraid that she, she's a little, little on the hawkish Overcompensation? Side. I don't know, maybe. I, but you know, Bill Clinton wasn't the most liberal president either. No, he, he was, was a centrist. Yeah, he was very centrist. So I, I'm expecting, I mean, I think she's actually to the left of him, but I'm expecting a very centrist administration. And I'm well, expecting her to win, obviously, although... Nate Silver says he's not going to win. So well, that yeah. uh, the survey I picked, apparently taken today or, or yesterday, but yeah, I, I think 
it's important that voters come out because this is a very, as I mentioned before, conse consequential election. And the, the alternative is not really an alternative. Uh, Hillary, I think, is a fine representation of what the first woman presidential candidate and president should be. Right. Um, mind, body, heart, soul. Uh, she, right. she's, she's got she's, that. She's talented. She's intellectual. She's gifted intellectually. She's, no, she's no, done the right thing. You no, know. no question. She cares. She's certainly tough enough. Um, she's tenacious. She certainly a, is. A, absolutely. Because you think... What she's gone through, to, from being uh, the governor's wife, to uh, being in the Senate, to being the Secretary of State, First Lady, I mean, she's, she's been battle-tested. Uh, but most, I think even more importantly is that she wants a job, and she's willing to do the homework and, and the necessary work to, to do a fine job. Uh, she's not riddled with ADD or uh, a tendency to bluster like somebody else we should, uh, we, we all know. A former president or, or, or well, uh, pres former uh, president and Donald Trump. Yes, <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. But um, Somebody yeah. made the comment about the, the Republican convention that none of the former president, President Bush wasn't there, uh, junior or senior, and none of the really eminent, uh, eminent, uh, Republican politicians to were there to support. their credit. To me, it's a litmus test. Um, I, I'm always a believer in putting country before party, and but that's uh, apparently a minority position in the current Republican administration and, and Republican Party, which is a shame. Um, because to Romney's great credit, George H. W. Bush's great credit, George W. Bush's great credit, they don't want to be any part of this this show. No, right. Um, what do you think is his appeal? I mean, what what are people feeling such that they need somebody like like uh, um, all Donald I Trump? I mean, well, all, all I can do would be to kind of mimic or parrot MSC, NBC commentators' opinions, which are uh, people are, are a lot of people are scared to death of terrorism. A lot of people have economic uncertainty. They feel that their wages are stagnating. They're stuck in a middle class that's not uh, not expanding. They're they're upset with all the bailouts. They think that's a rigged game. Wall Street runs everything, and they're just it's they're just lashing out. And right. they're looking for someone who can offer them easy answers. Right. And he provides them. W he provides with that. those answers. Right. He guarantees. Yeah. Before you said you can never guarantee a client the outcome of a, a trial. You yeah. certainly, as a presidential candidate, can't guarantee the country the the. Uh, uh, outcome of your policies. I mean, the Absolutely. president has little little influence actually when it comes really right down to it. Absolutely. Um, th those are just some reasons, and and probably like you, I I asked my friends, well, do you know anyone who's voting for Donald Trump? And the answer is no. No, I don't. And either. so I I think I'm living in a bubble. We're living in oh, a I'm bubble. Oh, I'm living in a bubble of my own making. I think. Of my own making, yeah. <laughs> as am I. But uh, there is a, a large segment of the population that is just disgusted by how things have, have, have gone and in, and not to be uh, paint a, a, a racial portrait of this but it's kind of the last cry for the angry white man I think that's right I think that you know people are always discussing they don't understand what white privilege is and I think that this is almost a sort of an explanation in that people think that they're that their life should be a certain way because they are a certain kind of person. And, you know, there, there, there it aren't any shoulds. There are, there's merit, yeah. you know. And so, you know, and th this always comes up in the uh, affirmative action discussion. That sure. can go down that path. And, you know, sure. So it, it is unfortunate that the white middle class, lower middle class male population feels that, that they've been left behind. But, you know, frankly... They have. They aren't doing as well as they were doing in, let's say, nineteen seventy. Well, you know? I mean, we we can. But so, but a lot of people are doing well. <laughs> I mean, that, that that that's right. And so there is this frustration, which I think, if if you're a Democrat or a liberal Democrat like myself, you understand the frustration. Um, but Donald Trump ain't your answer. Uh, right. Uh, that 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 just burned the place down, uh, kind of mentality. I agree with you. I agree. So with that, you. that 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 that's that's more than a little troubling. Let me um just. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I know we could talk about this for an hour, we could talk about this for an hour and a half, but I, re thank you so much. And I, My just, pleasure. Want, let me, would you like to make a final point about Donald Trump other than don't vote for him? <laughs> he it's, he's pro has a problem, right? He has a problem. Um, I, I guess what I would like to do is ask potential Donald Trump voters out there, why is he appealing? Because he, he's well-documented 
racist. He's, he's got mis misogynistic tendencies. He doesn't research issues. Failed he's got businessman. 80. He's a failed businessman. Um, What's so entrancing? I, 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 I don't get it. I don't we get don't it. don't get it. So, well, listen, Carlos, thank you so much for coming. I My really pleasure. appreciate it. My pleasure. And uh, you're watching Life in the Law, Marion Sasaki. Join us every week on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 at Think Tech Hawaii.